An audience with Jeffrey Gunlack, founder of Double Line. Founder of Double Line. And you don't even call me Godfather. People don't understand the concept of saving money mm -hmm. before you buy something. They're going to learn through the school of hard knocks. Right. I should have started my own company in 1992, 1993 at the latest. And I, I, instead, I just was one more day, one more day, one more day until 2009. I am best defined by my uh, astrological profile. You were born and raised in Buffalo. That's right. I had never been to a Bills game. We, f we couldn't afford stuff like that when I was a kid. And we, were, we were lower middle class. Because the couch wore out, uh -huh. and we didn't have enough money to buy a couch. Yep. Is, look, if you can't buy a dryer, you can't buy a couch. You can't buy a, buy a dryer, you can't buy a couch. When I was a kid, where we were really scratching to get by, we were at the supermarket, and we didn't have enough money, and we had to put stuff back. Credit cards had just kind of come come around. Mm -hmm. And I said, why don't you just put it on the credit card? And she just looked at me and she says, never, ever, ever yep. put food on a credit card, yep. ever. Never borrow money to buy food because that's a slippery slope which ends potentially very badly. I never forgot that. But also when I was a kid, there were no auto loans. You had to save the money and go and actually buy the car. I mowed lawns, I don't know if that counts. I can't, that probably was a second job. Got like $3 for mowing a lawn. Probably got great grades. Sure, I got straight A's. SATs. Sure, I was vir virtually perfect. I was heard a perfect score on my GRE for math, mm -hmm. for, for graduate school. And my parents wanted to go to University of Buffalo, which is where my, my father and my uncles went, because it was cheap. I really liked Dartmouth, I just, feel of the place when I got there. The more you study biology, the more it turns into chemistry. The more you study chemistry, the more it turns into physics. The more you, turn, you study physics, the more it turns into math. And the more you study math, it turns into philosophy. When I was studying mathematics at Yale in graduate school, I wanted to debunk Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which is one of the great theorems people say of the 20th century. And it basically it revolves around layers of infinity. Since infinity doesn't exist, the theorem is actually not valid. And I had to study about 100 hours a week. Um, there's politics in academia. I just study all the time and, and I, I got burned out on it. I was, I, I was actually going to be a philosophy professor, but that, that got even more remote. I was playing in, in bands and I played in band while I was at Yale. That was the one thing I did other than study. It was called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, the rich, yep. Robin Leach. We're going to count down the top paying professions. And number one was investment banker. And they say you have to work very hard to be very analytic. I work hard all the time and I'm extremely analytic. analytical. And I went to the Yellow Pages with the intention of applying to investment banking firms. There is no investment banker heading, but there was investment management. But there was there investment, was investment management. management. I had my resume and I sent it to everyone that had a bold face ad in the Los Angeles Yellow Pages. There were about 20, 20 of them. Anyway, I mean, that's how I ended up. I got a job finally in the bond department because mm -hmm. they needed a quant. Uh, they were so skeptical of my background that I was hired for $30,000 a year on a probationary period. I think it was 60 days. And I read all the fixed income stuff. And one was called Inside the Yield Book. And since I was fresh off of a PhD math program, I figured this is a good opportunity. I derived all the formulas from scratch oh, myself. Gosh. In a few days, I realized I know more about this than anybody here. I know more about this than anybody here. I know more about this than anybody here. Anybody here. Department, which is so incompetently managed, 
It took me a couple of years to realize that was actually a blessing because it provided opportunity. It provided opportunity. It provided opportunity. I was right about 70% of the time. And they were generally right about 49, which is the case with most investors. And when it would work out my way, I would say, and you don't even call me Godfather. And you don't even call me Godfather. And you don't, you even, don't even call, call me Godfather. Godfather. I didn't take very much risk with my career. And I think that young people should take a lot of risk. I'm talking like in their 20s. I was just focused on this place where I was. I can be sort of an optimizer. I optimize it, but I don't, I don't look for other doors. I should have started my own company in 1992. In 1992. And every astrologer has always said the same thing. They look at my chart and they go, I've never seen anything like this. You're just unbelievably Scorpio. I roll with the punches pretty well, so I'll be turning the other cheek for a while. And then once you really step on me, you're dead. You're dead, dead. They're going to learn through the school of hard knocks. Right. So we've taken a mighty leap forward this year in terms of heading towards you know, the debt cliff. A third of people want to work from home all the time. If they live in Los Angeles or San Francisco, why don't they just move to, you know, some town in Texas or something? It's no taxes, it's certainly cheaper real estate, and obviously I'm gonna pay that person less. Mm -hmm. So that puts deflationary pressure. After the Fed showed up, money started pouring into junk bonds and uh, corporate investment grade, that there's a perception, probably a misperception at the end of the day, that the prospect of them en masse going bad is so frightening mm -hmm. and so economically devastating that it won't be allowed to happen. I can't call them high yield because the yield isn't high. The yield isn't high. The yield isn't high. So we have to call them junk bonds. And the true money printing has a perfect record historically of failing. The people that were middle class turn into what the poor used to be. I know exactly what I'm paying in taxes, right. and it's over 50%. We've been doing a version of universal basic income since the 60s. It's called welfare. It's a bargain with the it's a, devil. It's a bargain with the devil. The United States now has about $154 trillion of unfunded promises to pay. Seven and a half times GDP. It doesn't seem possible that you can pay it back with purchasing power. Short-term feel-good things mm -hmm. being the priority, the land that it takes you to is one that must ultimately fail. You have to own things that will survive debasement. Hard assets, if we're going to add two zeros to the price of everything, you probably add two zeros to the price of stocks too. Right. So at least you're probably kind of floating along okay. I mean, the stock market it has a PE that is at such nosebleed levels relative to sober earnings. And we're, we're getting within spitting distance of the OO highest ever forward PE. The, the press hijacks things into directions where they want to go. I really don't like doing any more print interviews mm. because I can't control the content. I'm much more comfortable talking to you on camera yeah. because at least you're not putting words in my mouth. And you don't even call me Godfather.